greedy, impulsive, risk taker, short seller, market timer, words which describe traits of a general bad investor. Yet these same words perfectly describe George Soros. He used these exact traits to become one of the greatest investors of all time. Soros was never a conventional investor and he produced returns that were not conventional either. We have an average a performance of something like 35 percent over the last over the last 20, 20, 20 odd years 26 years but it's made up of years that which are uh, five percent or eight percent and years that are 60 percent or 100 percent that's how you get the average how did he do this by doing everything that you're supposed to not do as an investor The general rule taught by economists in textbooks and universities is that the market is efficient. Share prices already reflect all relevant information and investors accurately use this information to price stocks. AKA, the stock market is always fairly valued. But Soros never bought this idea for a second. To him it just didn't make sense. Humans aren't rational, especially not with money. There's no way the market could be efficiently priced or else it would be impossible to beat the market. He came up with a theory that no, prices are not efficient. Instead, most of the time they are distorted from reality, ranging from the negligible to the significant. My interpretation of financial markets directly contradicts the efficient market hypothesis, which has been the prevailing theory uh, about financial markets. That theory claims that markets tend towards equilibrium. Deviations occur in a random fashion and can be attributed to extraneous shocks. If that theory is valid, mine is false and vice versa. Soros knew that these economists were teaching something seriously wrong. You can't practically say that investors are always right, always unbiased, and always unemotional with the way they interpret information. Not everyone's Warren Buffett sitting stoically in an office in Omaha. Most investors tend to be very emotional and very biased to their own ways of thinking, not necessarily the truth. Soros decided that it was time that he developed his own theory to explain how the market works, something that was more practical. He would then use this to exploit it and make money through the ups and the downs of the market and the biased ways that investors invest. His fund started around 1969 where he turned $12 million in seed funding into well over $20 billion 36 years later. The strategies that he used, however, are not to be found in traditional textbooks or lecture rooms. Soros was an investor who exploited the booms and the busts of the market. He would look for situations where investors were getting either overly optimistic or too pessimistic on a certain asset. But in order to accurately predict these patterns, he would develop a philosophy for how the market works. Soros' philosophy revolves around two key ideas. Failability and reflexivity. If you can grasp these two ideas, you can begin to understand how he was able to trade in and out of the market to a high level of consistency. The first principle is failability. I've developed a philosophy which is, which is the, the basis of my actions in the stock market and, the action, uh, and my philanthropy. And that is the recognition that we are all fallible. That we, it's not only that the other fellow is wrong, but that you are wrong too. Fallibility is the simple principle that all investors are not perfect. In situations that you have thinking participants, the participants' views of the world never perfectly correspond to the actual state of affairs. People can gain knowledge of individual facts and truth, but when it comes to forming an overall view, their perspective is bound to be either biased or inconsistent or both. Investors and their opinions are failable. Reflexivity states that these failable views 
impact the situation to which they relate. For example, investors' imperfect views directly impact the market, which in turn reflects its impact back to the investor, which again, the investor reflects its impact back onto the market. You are one of the actors and your decisions are one of the things that changed the situation. So it's a, it's a sort of a self-developing, self-evolving world that we live in, uh, in which our fallibility, uh, our mistakes are an important element in shaping history. So let's look at a market cycle to show you how these principles work. It's important to know this because Soros used these principles to know when to jump in and out of an investment, when to short an asset, when to go long, and when to go all in. With a traditional market cycle, earnings start to go up. In turn, investors see this, and rightly so, they start to buy stocks, and this results in stock prices going up too. Now, because stock prices are going up, it attracts more buyers into the market whose actions drive prices higher and higher. After some time, there becomes a disconnect between reality, earnings, and market prices. As more investors see prices going higher, they buy more stocks and it becomes a self-reinforcing thing. Failable investors are reflecting their imperfect views onto the market and this forces prices higher and higher. Soon markets become clearly out of touch with reality and prices are so distant from earnings that they reach an inflection point. A twilight period ensues when people continue to play the game although they no longer really believe in it. Eventually, a crossover point is reached when the trend turns down and prices lose their last prop. Hesitancy turns to negativity and prices start to drop. Falling prices encourage more people to sell and investors' fallible views reinforce themselves on the downside. Prices shoot down quickly as fear is a powerful emotion until at some point, reality hits again as prices are so attractive relative to earnings and a buying frenzy starts, giving rise to a new bullish trend. This is the traditional market cycle which is directly impacted by investors' fallible viewpoints reflecting themselves onto the market. Soros would use his theory of fallibility and reflexivity numerous times throughout his investment career to predict the booms and the busts of market cycles, simply betting long when the market's going up and shorting it when he expects it to go down. 1969 was an early example where Soros could test his theory. Real estate investment trusts were new and had just started growing in popularity. Soros used fallibility and reflexivity to gain an understanding that this would start to form into a bubble. But before the bubble would pop, there would be years of hype and speculation in a market melt up. It was time for Soros to pounce and to test his theories in the real market. So he goes long on REITs as a short term bet. And he's correct. Investors pile huge amounts of money into this new asset class. From 1969 to 1974, REITs expand from a total asset size of about 1 billion to more than 21 billion, fueled through leverage, financing, and the greed of fallible humans. Soros walks away with a cheeky $1 million in profits, and now he has some actual evidence to back up his new philosophies. These two ideas start to become the bedrock for his investing style, both used throughout his career to analyze which direction the market is heading. But he would have to combine this with a mix of strategies if he truly wanted to make the big dollars. Most investors find it very hard to make big bets. Even if they're pretty certain that it's gonna work, there's a mental hurdle where they just can't go big. They can bet 10% of a portfolio, 20, maybe even 30%, but anything more than that, they could never bring themselves to do. Soros never had such hurdles. If he saw a good opportunity, 
he would bet the farm. Often it wouldn't be his farm because he would borrow money, but the bet would be large. Now these opportunities would appear in different areas. Sometimes it was in currencies, sometimes commodities, sometimes stocks, bonds or derivatives. To Soros, it didn't matter the asset per se, it didn't matter the consequence of the investments, what mattered was that there was money on the table. Black Wednesday, the week when Soros made $1 billion and reportedly broke the Bank of England, is the perfect example to show you how this eccentric man thinks. I say reportedly because Soros reiterated that the break would have happened anyway if he made the investment or not. Others disagree. A bit of background. In 1976, European nations were trying to make sense of different national currencies within the Union. To try and solve the issues, they formed the European Rate Mechanism ERM. The ERM artificially tied exchange rates to each other in order for governments to influence the relative price of their national currency compared to other countries. In 1991, Britain decided to join the European ERM, a decision which some politicians thought was sensible and the right move to make, but Soros knew it would not work out well. When Britain joined the ERM, the rate was set to 2.95 Deutsche Marks per pound sterling, a rate which politicians agreed upon, but Soros thought was too high. With Britain's excessive inflation, poor economy and current interest rates, how could they justify such a high ERM? The pound was clearly artificially overvalued. During the summer of 1992, Soros began building a short position against the British pound. But he was sure on this trade, it was as plain as daylight, so he bet the house. In the summer, he started with a $1.5 billion position, and by September, he increased it to $10 billion. Just to put that into context, $10 billion was more than the entire value of the funds that he managed. It was 1.5 times all of the assets at Quantum Fund. How did he do this? Through leverage, of course. Why use your own money when you can borrow? And he did this in large amounts, sticking to a motto of Soros's that if the odds really are in your favor, you must bet big and go for the jugular. And if, if there's one thing I've learned from him is that when you're right and you know something, you really feel it, you can't have enough. And the biggest mistake, if, if I had to sum up his investment philosophy in one sentence, it's, it's that it's not whether you're right or wrong, you just have to have the max on when you're right. And the bet paid off. The pressure that Soros and other traders had put on the governments forced them to abandon the ERM and the British pound felt the full effect. The next day, the pound fell 15% versus the German mark and 25% against the US dollar. Soros walks away with an extra $1 billion smiling. The Bank of England walks away, shoulders drooping, losing 6 billion. Soros was never afraid to bet big when he knew that he was right, even if the perceived consequence was the breaking of a country's national bank. Now, some investors would look at this man almost as if he was mad. What if things went wrong and he lost $10 billion? That is all of your money and all of your investors' money lost in one trade. Crazy. But this was not the case. He'd organized his multi-billion dollar trade against the pound in such a way that he only had minimal amounts to lose. But in the sterling, in the investment there, uh, yes. where you captured the attention of the world yes. and certainly the Bank of England, right. Did you put $10 billion at risk or yes. not? Yes. Now, was that yes. all profit or was that principle? Well, that it, was, was, it, was, it, was, uh, it was our principle, but it was not all at risk because the most we could have lost would have been, let's say, 2 3%. Because there was no, it was a, you know, a high reward, low risk bet. If for whatever reason Britain had stayed in the ERM and the pound maintained its value, while well, Soros would pay back the money to whom he'd borrowed, plus a small percentage in interest, worst case, 
he loses a few small percents. The best case, he gains a billion dollars and the fund makes 15 to 20 percent return on capital. Huge gains. Soros' idea that it's not whether you're right or wrong, but how much money you make when you're right and how much money you lose when you're wrong pays off for him. Almost a decade from Black Wednesday, another opportunity would come along, and this time it would be Thailand, not Britain, left with a broken currency. George was someone who paid attention not just to market trends, but also to political ones. And this would serve him handily. Every now and again, an opportunity would come along so juicy that Soros could not resist. One of the things that he would look to profit from was when governments try to interfere with free market forces. Just like when Britain artificially fixed exchange rates with the ERM, Thailand 1997, something similar was happening. Soros was someone who learned how failable governments could be when they try to be too direct and overpowering with their policies. I think he learned this deeply growing up in Hungary with the Germans invading. Whenever he saw excessive government intervention in the markets, he often knew that it was a situation where he could profit from. Thailand, a quarter of a century ago, was having some economic issues. They had a very high interest rate, which attracted foreign money into the country because they could get higher returns on investments. But this foreign money resulted in an excess production of goods and services. The problem was they didn't have the demand to buy the goods and services produced. So their economy began to struggle. Combined with high foreign debt, things were not looking good. Inevitably, what would have to happen is the Thai baht, their national currency, would need to devalue. But the Bank of Thailand didn't want this to happen. They liked having the strong fixed baht. So they intervened. Whenever the Thai baht looked like it would devalue, they would use their foreign exchange reserves to buy the baht and keep it stable at 25 baht to 1 US dollar. Soros saw this intervention and he smelled opportunity. To him, the free market was bound to win. The Bank of Thailand could not hold up the baht forever as they did not have infinite reserves. In January 1998, Soros makes his move. He uses $1 billion to borrow Thai baht, and then he converts this baht into dollars. Soros just needs the Thai baht to get weaker so that he can pay back his debt at a lower rate. Put simply, he has a huge short position against the baht. He needs it to devalue. But in the trading world, when someone as big as Soros makes a move, other traders follow. They too jump on board with Soros and a huge position starts to accumulate against Thailand's national currency. The Bank of Thailand hurriedly tried to defend their currency by using their foreign exchange reserves to buy back the baht, but as predicted, they start to run out of money. Eventually, they have no choice but to let free market forces take place and the Thai baht devalues. It goes from 25 baht to 1 USD to 50 baht to 1 USD. Soros then uses his strong dollars to pay back his debt in the now weaker Thai baht and once again profits where government intervention fails. While most investors liked the assurance of having other investors share their same idea, Soros never looked for such assurance. He realized that the opportunity was not in thinking the same as other investors, because you just get average results, but spotting where investors are making mistakes. These mistakes would often come when people applied conventional investing rules to a market where the rules had now changed. This is where Soros saw his advantage. I am particularly interested in changes in the rules of the game. And so I'm looking for the new game and the new rules. Sometimes a particular style of investing would work at one point in the market, but at another point, the best way to invest is completely the opposite because the rules of the game have changed. 
If you were investing in houses in 2006 and 2007, the best strategy was to go long and to buy houses. One year later though, the rules had changed. 2008, the best strategy was to short houses. Soros realized this very early on, and this is why he made his investing style fluid, able to adapt and change at any moment. He said, I watch out for telltale signs that a trend may be exhausted. Then I disengage from the herd and I look for a different investment thesis. Or if I think that the trend has been carried to excess, I may probe against it. For him, it was all about timing, making the right decisions by finding out what the new rules are. But sometimes you're never 100% sure if the new rules are just made up in your head or if they're grounded in reality. To test his ideas, Soros would use the age-old judge, the market itself. Well, it was a laboratory where I could test yeah. uh, my ideas. It's, 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 it's a hard task, Master, yes, you see. You know. Just like a scientist in a workshop testing chemicals, Soros's workshop was the market. A cold-hearted judge, yes, but it will always tell you the truth. He could only know for sure his new rules were right if he put them into the market and the results came out green. He only knew that the pound was overvalued if the market showed him in 1992 with Black Wednesday. He could only be sure that the rules of real estate had moved from a reasonable buy to a definite short if the market proved it in 2008. The market was always a place where Soros went to see if he was right. And if he was right, the nice thing for him was that it would pour out cash flow. Because the market was ever-changing, Soros was constantly changing with it and looking for areas where he could profit. This gave him a style where he would often be a black sheep. When most investors were going right, he would go left. When politicians advocated for something, he would short it. He wasn't necessarily being political or trying to go against people. He was simply playing the market. He did what he thought would make him and his investors the most money. His style may not be traditional. It may have serious national consequences at times. You may not like it, but one thing's for sure. He was right more than he was wrong. And the returns speak for themselves.